Welcome back everybody. If you watch my channel for a while, you may have noticed one major change in how I value stocks. Because before I used to run through my whole discounted cash flows evaluation, as well as my multiple models valuation, to try to come up with some kind of price target. But you might have noticed that I haven't done that in a while and I focused almost exclusively on historical price ratios. So in this video, we're going to review what I used to do to value stocks, go over how I'm actually valuing them now, and then I'll break down why I think it's a better approach for what I'm doing. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, if you've been here since last year, you probably remember me going through my valuation spreadsheets and coming up with a couple options to try to determine what they call a quote, intrinsic value. Now, first, I would do a discounted cash flow analysis where I would calculate the free cash flow, a growth rate for the next five years, and then a growth rate in perpetuity. Then I would use a general required rate of return, which some people use as a weighted average cost of capital. And then I would add that to the stock's total common equity, and it would spit out a fair value price per share, which I would then add another 20% margin of safety to, and it would give me a number that may or may not make any sense. And just for clarity, this example was back in November of last year when Caterpillar was at $247 a share. This model and the assumptions that I made said the intrinsic value was only $181 a share. And in case you're wondering, Caterpillar's up about 40% since I did this example, so it's a good thing that I completely ignored my DCF valuation. And we're going to get into what the issue is with this model here in a minute. But first, let's take a look at the other exercise I would do, which is the multiples model. Now, with the multiples model, I would try to find up to four other companies that could be considered competitors. And then I would compare their price ratios to the stock I was evaluating and then calculate some fair value based on an average or median of the competition's price ratios. And I would do this for both price to earnings as well as price to cash flow. And then once I got all my price targets done, I would look at them all together. And as you can see in this example, sometimes they can be all wildly different and even different than the average analyst target price. And the reason why they're so different is because they all focus on slightly different things, plus they're all heavily influenced by our own personal assumptions. If we go back to the DCF model, you can see that I'm the one that's deciding what the growth rate's going to be, as well as what the terminal growth rate's going to be, plus my required rate of return. And all of those things greatly impact the final number. And of course, those numbers should be based on my own personal analysis of what I think their future prospects are going to be, but any change in those numbers drastically changes this quote-unquote intrinsic value of the company. Or even when we look at something as basic as total common equity, because that's a big part of the calculation as well. And you have companies that have negative common equity because of how they use debt as leverage, like McDonald's or Lowe's or Starbucks. They're never likely going to have a realistic valuation with this method. Or even the companies that tend to trade at a premium, whether it's a high growth company, a big tech company, or just a company like Visa. They're almost never going to be at fair value according to these models. So should we just never buy them? And if we go back to the multiples models, there's one huge assumption that you're making, that any of these companies are a good comparison to the company that you're actually evaluating, and that they have the same outlook, the same advantages or disadvantages, and that they should be priced the same way. And it's a very crude way to do it, because if you pick the wrong peers, your number is basically worthless. And this got me thinking, why do we focus on value calculations so much? Because we see this everywhere, especially online, where people are talking about how something is overvalued or undervalued. And you frequently hear things like, stock Y is trading at X percent below its intrinsic value. And my question is, whose value did they use? Like, what model are they using? What assumptions did they plug in? Because we hear these words, intrinsic value, and we automatically assume that it means something. But it literally means nothing unless you understand the method and assumptions that a person is using. And each one of us is going to do it in a slightly different way. So just because someone says it's trading at 30% below its intrinsic value, it really doesn't mean anything without more context. But I think the reason why we focus on value so much is because it's relatively easy to calculate and more importantly, it makes us feel good. And that's because it makes us feel like we're doing something, like we're doing our due diligence by plugging numbers into this spreadsheet, we're getting an output, and we're only buying stocks when they're at good value. But that's where I actually think we're wrong because just because we plug some numbers into a spreadsheet and we feel good about what it says, it's really a false illusion of safety. And especially when we go back and we look at them all together and they're all different like this. Like how is this information even helpful to us? How would we actually use it to make a decision. Honestly, I don't think you can. And that's why in the case of Caterpillar, I just ignored all these and I focused on price ratios instead. 
Which brings me to what I'm actually doing now to measure valuation in a stock. Like All I really do is look at the past 10 years of history of their price to cash flow and price to earnings ratios. And what I'm looking for is where the company is trading relative to their own history in terms of value and not just price. So if we go back to the Caterpillar example, back in November of last year, we can see that their price to cash flow had dipped down to a level that hadn't been seen since the 2020 pandemic dip. And then before that in 2019, and then again, back in 2017. So from a straight price to cash flow perspective, it looked like an attractive ratio based on their own history. And that's because the ratio was telling you the price multiple that you're paying for the amount of cash flows that the company is generating. So by that definition, when the number is lower, then the company is cheaper. And when the number is higher, then they're more expensive. With the idea being that a company is likely to have their price multiple expand the way that it has in the past, assuming the business continues to perform well and the broader environment supports it. And now if we want to look at price to earnings, it's a little bit wonky. So if we change this to be the last five years, we can see the price to earnings a little bit better. Now, you can see again in November of last year, price to earnings was also at one of its lowest points over the past five years. So again, price to value in terms of earnings looked pretty attractive. And obviously the key is not just to take the number by itself and say, oh, it's low, so it must be good because things change over time, situations change, and the environment can change as well. Here's a good example of what I mean. We talked about McDonald's a couple weeks ago, and if you just look at the last 10 years, their price to earnings and price to cash flow are starting to look attractive as they've come down in price. And while I do think McDonald's price is coming down to a nice range, I also understand that their price multiple may not expand like it has in the past due to what's going on in the macro environment. Because both their price to earnings and price to cash flow are quite a bit below their five-year averages. But you have to remember that over the last 15 years, U.S. stocks have pretty much been in a zero interest rate environment. So naturally, stocks tend to go up, but especially stocks that tend to use a lot of debt in their business. So real estate investment trusts or REITs and companies like McDonald's traded at higher multiples than maybe they normally would. But now we're in a higher interest rate environment, so companies like McDonald's that carry a lot of debt may not naturally trade at their five-year average multiple anymore because that five-year multiple was expanded due to the zero interest rate environment. Or for another example, let's talk about Amazon because people were like, why did you buy Amazon in 2024 when it already almost doubled the year before? But just look at Amazon's price to cash flow metric. It was at its lowest level it had been in the last 10 years just this January. And remember, I'm not talking about stock price. I'm talking about the price you're paying for the amount of cash flows that Amazon's generating. So if you believe in their ability to continue generating cash flows at a good rate, then you're currently paying the lowest price you would have paid in a decade to buy their company. And that's at today's prices. Because based on this, it looks like Amazon is still trading at good value. Plus, when you match that up with the fact that they've improved their profitability and still have multiple areas that are growing at a high rate, you would assume that their price will continue to go up as the business continues growing. And that doesn't even include their price multiple simply expanding from where it's at today. And that's one of the reasons why I like this method is because it's more than just a number to say, oh, it's trading at higher or lower than this number. It still makes you think about what the actual business outlook is for the company. Because it's an easy visual to understand to see how a company is trading in terms of its own price to value history. But then I still need to think through the current state of their business to decide if their underlying cash flows or earnings will continue to grow at the same pace or if their price multiple is still likely to expand based on their future outlook. And I know you might say, well, the DCF model has the future growth rate in it. And in theory, you should be thinking about that business outlook before you plug that number in. And I totally agree with that. But I do think it's a little bit easier to just say, oh, here's a blank space in my spreadsheet. I'm going to put 12% because that's what it says on some website and go from there without really thinking about it as much as we probably should. Okay, so I've kind of touched on it already, but let's talk about why I think this is a better approach than trying to determine a specific price target. And there was a specific tweet I saw that made me think about this. It was a tweet that actually is now deleted where a person was saying how offended they were that Apple was trading at a 30 PE when they have little to no growth. And we've talked about this a little bit before, but when asked why they were offended by it, this is what they responded with. The entire point of the job is to use logic and analysis to predict future prices of securities that are attached to real businesses. 
The real business isn't performing well, and the stock hasn't reflected that reality for most of the past three years. Now, first off, Apple had record revenues in 2022, so not really the last three years, maybe the last year and a half or two years, but whatever. The bigger issue is that his thoughts on the market were actually wrong. And I want to make this clear because I think sometimes we get confused. We calculate a value in a spreadsheet. We look at someone's you know, intrinsic value number, and we think that those things mean something in terms of the future price in the market. But it really doesn't mean anything in terms of the price unless you're saying the underlying fundamentals are going to influence the people's opinion in the market because that's actually how markets work. And I kind of responded with that by saying, but prices are based on the opinions of market participants. Now, those opinions are influenced by actual business performance, but they're not solely based on it. Also, Apple makes $100 billion plus a year in cash flow. Okay, so I probably didn't need that last part, but I was trying to show one of the possible reasons why the market believes Apple is worth a 30 PE with little to no growth right now. And part of that is the strength in their brand. Part of it is the hope for future growth. And part of it is that even with no growth, they make $100 billion plus a year in cash flow. So either way, it's enough to keep people buying the company, even with little to no growth right now. But that's also why applying something like a discounted cash flow model to every single stock really doesn't make sense because Apple is never going to be attractive in that model. And Visa is never going to be attractive in that model. Costco is never going to be attractive in that model. Or Amazon is likely never to be attractive in that model. So I started thinking if some of the best companies in the market are never going to be attractive using this model, then why am I continuing to use it? Now, just to be clear, they may be in the future when they're much later in their life cycle, they're more mature, but that's a totally different type of investment. And so the point I'm trying to make is that market prices aren't determined by calculation. This is why in the past I've said that there's no alpha in a spreadsheet. Investors, institutions, and hedge funds all have this pretty much automated by now. They can do a bunch of different valuation models at the drop of a hat. And yes, we can all have slightly different assumptions and all of that, but market prices aren't determined by a valuation calculation alone. They're determined by the collective opinions and sentiment of market participants about that particular company, which is why you always see companies that report really good earnings, but then the stock tanks because their future outlook is worse than people were expecting. So all this is why I don't spend time calculating price targets anymore. I'm trying to spend the most time possible really digging into their core business and understanding the future outlook of the company. Because to me, that's the most important place to spend my time. And that's why business is my first criteria whenever I'm evaluating a stock. And in general, I won't buy a stock unless that business rating is good. Operational performance is my next most important criteria. And then finally, valuation. But you guys have seen me buy things even when I rated the valuation as poor. Because to me, the most important thing is to pick the right companies. Because if I do that, valuation won't matter as much in the long run. And just as a simple example, look at this basic calculation. Let's say I have stock one that's going to grow at about 15% a year over the next five years, but I buy it at a high valuation. Then stock two that grows at 8% a year. Now stock one easily outperforms stock two regardless of valuation because it's growing at a faster rate. I mean, this isn't rocket science. But even if stock one was in a dip and let's say I bought it at a 15% discount, then obviously it's the best performer. But what you see is Buying stock one, even at a premium, is better than buying a cheaper stock that doesn't have the same future prospects. And look, I know, this is a really basic example that has a lot of assumptions kind of built in, but the point that I'm trying to make is that picking the best companies is really the most important thing, because if you do that and you plan to hold for a long period of time, then the valuation matters less and less. Because the better investment is going to be the one that compounds the most over time, not the one that you bought at the best price. And I don't know about you guys, but I've had many examples in the past where I used price targets and it made me miss out on really great companies because I was so focused on, okay, let's take Apple, for example. If I had it rated at $110 and it was trading at $130, well, it's overvalued and I want to wait until it comes down. But the reality is that anybody buying at 110 or 130 were really the winners, and the people who weren't were the ones who missed out or who decided to buy a cheaper stock that was just inferior overall. And look, my perspective on this has just simply changed over time. I just don't believe that if we look at a stock and we calculate a value and we say the stock is trading at X price, but it's really worth Y price, and the market just doesn't know it yet. And to me, that's just simply not true. Of course, the market knows it. Everybody has spreadsheets. But for whatever reason, that stock has fallen out of favor with the market. And that's really what we need to focus on. 
because as investors, it's up to us to figure out why and if it's something that they can turn around. Like in the example of Starbucks, I personally don't believe that it's going to turn around, at least the way that I expect as an investor. So I sold that stock. Whereas MSCI and Lululemon, I do believe they're going to be able to turn it around. So I continued holding. Now, I might end up being right or wrong, and only time will tell. But that's the decision that I have to make that has almost nothing to do with the current valuation. Because just the target price isn't actually going to tell me any of that. And so that's why now I basically use historical price ratios to get an idea of how a stock is trading based on its own history. And that's helpful because it allows me to compare stock against itself as opposed to trying to manufacture some kind of comparison with another company. Because every stock is unique in terms of how they invest in R&D or how they use CapEx. And so one price to earnings number or cash flow number isn't always going to be apples to apples compared to another company. That's why I prefer to compare their ratios to themselves. And that's why while the 19 price to operational cash flow may be expensive for one company, it's absolutely a steal for a company like Amazon, at least based on its own history. And then when I do a deep analysis on their business and make a decision as to if their future prospects are good or not, in the example of Amazon, the future prospects are really strong and something that I have a lot of conviction in. So that combined with the fact that they're trading at an attractive price to value ratio means that I'm likely to buy regardless of what the price is or what it's done recently. And that's why you've seen me add Amazon, NVIDIA, MSCI, Google, and Lululemon in 2024 because they actually met those criteria. And I just didn't see the point of calculating a price target that really didn't add a lot of value to my analysis because valuation does matter, but to me, it's not a primary consideration. Buying the best possible businesses, so that's where I spend most of my time. Now, of course, only time will tell if it ends up actually giving me the type of returns I want as an investor. So are you all actually using price targets for your analysis? Let me know what you're doing to determine valuation down in the comments below. Now, if you want to know why I have so much conviction about Amazon and why I actually added Lululemon to my portfolio, click on this video right here. Hope you guys have a great day out there. Financial independence is true freedom. So keep building and stacking wins. And I'll see you on the next one. Peace.